Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then GraphWell is the solution for you. GraphWell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. GraphWell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to gravwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. Please join Ocean and Security Weekly right here in Rhode Island in beautiful Newport at Salve Regina University at the Pell Center on Wednesday, March 18th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. for Ocean Cybersecurity Exchange Day. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ocean2020 to register for free. How about that? You can come to a conference right here. In Rhode Island. Free! Ha hang out with us for a day. What's better than that? I know the Pell Center. I Everyone should come. You should come. You should I totally will be come. There. That'd come be on awesome. down. If I'm not traveling, I swear I'll be there. I, I've spoken at Pell Center like three times. Like, I yeah. love Francesca. I don't know if that's what you're working yes, with. It. It, it, yes, it is. Francesca's awesome. She's awesome. <laughs> yes. Yes. So it's going to be a great day. I'm looking forward to it. Um, O'Shea, thanks for sticking around for, for the entire episode. Now is the security news section. We were mentioning the Bluetooth low energy vulnerabilities Whoa. that were released. Whoa. Uh, and of course, it has to have a fancy name, so it's Swain Tooth. Is it, okay, uh, I was going to say, is it Bluetooth low energy? Yeah, it is. I had not said it out loud yet. I had only read it and said it in yeah, my but, head. But it doesn't <laughs> have a logo. That's Super what I want to know. Swain Tooth, uh, a family of 12 vulnerabilities, <sighs> apparently more under non-disclosure yeah. across uh, Bluetooth low energy SDKs of six major SOC vendors. Lead back to your question about uh, system on a chip uh, or SOC, the vulnerabilities expose flaws in these implementations that allow an attacker in radio range to trigger deadlocks, crashes, and buffer overflows or completely bypass security depending on the circumstances. Uh, deadlocks and crashes are pretty, if it, you cause a deadlock situation, doesn't that essentially render the system? Define deadlock exactly. Yeah, I'm, I don't know exactly. Is it just a Bluetooth deadlock or is it a full system? Yeah. Deadlock. Does that just, I don't know what that means. And, and, and how is that different from a crash? Simple. We call that a denial of service. Denial of service, yeah. right? Yeah, the deadlock is when essentially like the utilization heats up on your on your box or on your, uh, mm -hmm. on your on your device. So too many apps are running and then nothing else can run. So it, it may not crash. Yeah. But it's, it's still like there. It's, it's at a crawl. It's, yeah. a, yeah. it's, like it's taking up CPU point. and memory and yeah. spiking them. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it says it causing a hard fault or memory corruption, uh, improper synchronization between user code and the SDK, leaving the user code being stuck at some point. Yeah, so it's essentially a different yeah. type of denial of service. Yeah, but the, the really creepy, sorry, if I may, the really creepy thing about this is like this is like Android versions almost like 6 through 10, essentially. So if your Bluetooth, if your, uh, Bluetooth device has permissions across other applications, any data that's written via Bluetooth, those applications is essentially vulnerable. So imagine your, we'll say Twitter, <laughs> yep. uh, Twitter or uh, your SoundCloud or your uh, Spotify, any data that's written at time mm -hmm. into, uh, the, uh, into Bluetooth because Bluetooth doesn't actually read encrypted traffic that's unencrypted. So it's the same thing as like if you're memory scraping in a lot of ways, right? Like if you're memory scraping on a box, you're looking to grab like unencrypted. Uh, so as long as you're not doing like Pornhub.com over Bluetooth, you're okay? I think that's like, so, so <laughs> the weird thing is, I think that's like socially acceptable now. Like, but wait, <laughs> I, so audio, do audio devices talk low energy or is that tr more traditional Bluetooth? Because the way I understand, so, or again? is it both? Say uh, again? So it would an audio application that wants to say stream audio over to your car. a Bluetooth technology. Exactly. Exactly. It, it would be that would typically be Bluetooth classic unless you're talking Apple AirPods, yep. which use low energy in some proprietary manner oh, to be able to do enough data transfer. Um, I how, wonder if however, it's a, if a you're, second data if channel, like the audio is going over classic, but low energy is being used uh, for some I think other thing. They say you lo all low energy, <laughs> but mm. that said. Um, uh, the new version of Bluetooth Low Energy, uh, the name is escaping me, does have some capability to do higher speed data transfers mm -hmm. and longer distances, not the same time. Because I was going to say, yeah, it's Bluetooth, a, Bluetooth 5. In a yeah. higher uh, audio quality and bandwidth, we're talking like Aptex technology right. typically gives you a much better quality, yep. right? So like when I buy headphones, for example, I look at what's supported on the Android phone that I have and I match that to the headphones that I'm mm -hmm. buying because there's different 
high quality app deck is the one that comes to mind but it's not supported on all headphones it's not supported on all, all devices. devices so yep. but since i'm an audiophile like i try and match that and mm -hmm. that's all bluetooth classic but it sounds like bluetooth yep. low energy so, is used so for other applications so absolutely classic so classic for the audiophile f area and where i question how they did bluetooth low energy for the airpods mm -hmm. uh classic is 2.1 meg per second mm -hmm. uh uh, low energy is 1.1 to 1 meg per second. And right. so that would be and like Bluetooth peripheral devices like a keyboard? Yep. That Bluetooth they could potentially be scraping bursty. keyboard? Like or like or data or file share apps too. File share apps are yep. the weird thing. That's, that's This is why I think it's kind of creepy because majority of people that actually are... Like I've done this before as a screw up, but I've actually shared like small, small, small files off of my device with the people mm -hmm. that I do there within like a circle of me mm -hmm. via yeah. Bluetooth. It's like screw you guys. I'm like airdrop. I'm not, I'm not, email, stuff, yeah, I'm not right? emailing you guys. You're right here. Mm -hmm. Boom, 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 yep. boom, boom. But at the same time, if it has permissions written to Bluetooth, it it does grab it before it does grab before mm -hmm. it, the RCE could grab before it's mm -hmm. encrypted, and that's the freaky oh, thing. Got it. And that's a lot. That's like Android's. Like I think it's six through ten or five through ten. But and I keep would in mind, think of like, life is like eight. So like, but I would like think of keys keystroke yep. kind of keystroke stuff off of stuff. E off of your well, keyboard yeah, because yeah. that would be low energy probably, right? Because you but don't need that high bandwidth. Uh, so you know, most of the keyboards now are doing low energy. Um, just because of battery saving and, and, and yeah. so forth. Um, that also becomes really interesting because um, they will often use a pin which in, in, right. as, in, as some encryption. So the Bluetooth low energy traffic will be encrypted, but the encryption is really easy to break. Mm. Mm. And you don't necessarily need to capture the initial pairing. Uh, no, sorry, you do need to capture the pairing. Uh, but depending on your device, keyboards... Because they have a man to machine interface, you get to put in a random pin. Most of the time, these low energy devices are using pins of all zeros. Right. Is it really encryption if it's that easy to break, or are they just doing some sort of encoding? It's encryption. It does use the pin as an input key to uh, an encryption algorithm for if, uh, with Classic, it was E0, um, uh, an encryption algorithm that the Bluetooth Special Interest Group developed themselves. I don't know if they're still using E0 for uh, low energy. I don't remember. But that's where that's where this kind of vulnerability really has it interesting from a keystroke perspective to start monitoring keystrokes, instead of doing it through the USB or through the OS, you can actually do now, it through Bluetooth. From from my understanding, this is you know, just reading this really quick because I hadn't heard about this until just now, and Shane is like, "Hey, did you hear about that Bluetooth thing?" I'm like, what? <laughs> "Paul's story number one, <laughs> um, number uh, two. Actually. Looking at oh, the yeah, it no, it was number one. Uh, and looking at this, this oh, uh, issues one. with the SDK, so." Effectively, issues with the firmware that gets pushed to the Bluetooth low energy chipset. So that's so they five use, to like ten. But they use the right. SDK yeah. to basically build the firmware to yes. put on the yeah. Yes, uh, and the one that I thought was fascinating. You start scrolling through this article um, in section two. Uh, so 2.2, .2, potentially other vulnerable products, because they tested a bunch, mm -hmm. and they tested a bunch that had specific chipsets. And the one that's right in the top of the list is the CC2540, which is, in my opinion, one of the most popular Bluetooth low energy chipsets across mm -hmm. everything. And clearly they said 307, which go to like the chart is like it, this. Yeah, it, it's <sighs> used in, well, it, it goes back to our previous conversation. You know, once someone makes a chipset in an SDK, it's easy to work with. People develop yep. software. It gains yep. widespread adoption. Yep. A vulnerability in that system then is propagated across thousands uh, or millions of devices. Yep. devices it's yeah. creepy <laughs> yeah like one of my favorite bluetooth low energy hacking tools for doing sniffing and some other stuff is based on the 2540 mm -hmm. which yeah. tool is this? uh now which is now vulnerable <laughs> so yes, uh yes but now uh speaking of creepy i want to go to jeff's story number two which <coughs> i also flagged in there uh and i know you can neither confirm nor deny uh, CAA controlled global encryption company mm -hmm. for decades, according to this report. Uh, I also had this as my story number two. You might need that. Yeah, I think we all yeah. flagged it. Oh, Jeff. What's going on here? Come on, Jeffrey. <laughs> I really cannot comment on this particular story. <laughs> Sorry. That's a good thing. Oh, that, that means he's still under oh, yep. certain NSA. Uh, it's for life, man. Yeah. It's for, yeah. Life. It's for life. Go, Matt. It's for life. It's for life. So, uh, Jeff, turn off your Jeff's ears. Uh, turn off your ears because we can only comment of what. No, was he can released. have ears. He just can't have a voice. Yeah, right. he can't speak. Right. Yeah, I can zip listen. your lip. Oh yeah, right. right. Turn your ears on and uh, just mute your mic. Mute your mic, um, <laughs> and you can yell at us and scream. And if we're getting things wrong, and you just don't, we won't put you on camera or any of that stuff. But, <laughs> hey. uh, wait, I won't sign language. But uh, carry on. 
I thought this was a fascinating story. So did the CIA create this encryption company or... Uh, they purchased it. They pr- I gotcha. They purchased it and uh, intentionally backdoored it and then hoodwinked all of the employees and or when there were employees that were starting to ask questions, they either paid them off or fired them. Ooh. Interesting. So did and, th- I wonder... And, and did or then planted new folks that knew... And uh, at one point, they actually had a uh, someone who was designing cryptographic algorithms for crypto that they effectively paid off to just keep their mouth shut to say, "Yeah, this is good." And he was a so very the well. The employees respected. know that it was the CIA, or no. they knew that it was a front no. company because the CIA is they, known for creating yeah, front companies. One, for, yeah. uh, from my reading of the story, that any given time, one or two people in the entire company knew that this was a front. Interesting. For both the CIA and the East Germans? And it could very well have been Ukrainians? the CIA that planted those B&D. two. Oh, they were. Employed. They were. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, well, because that's, I mean, what little that we yeah. know publicly about the CIA is that if you look at the Hollywood version as an example, right, that they are trained to basically take on a persona mm-hmm. and work a regular job, but right. really yep. be yep. a spy. Right. I mean, right. it's really a spy yeah. agency. Yeah. Lee, what did you say the agency name was? I thought it was BND, but I'm not BND, sure. I think you're right. That sounds familiar. Is that like the, front, German, the, that's front like the German company? Or, or, yeah. BND is German CIA. Yeah it, was, it, it, what, yeah, it was not the Germans, but it was like the East Germans. And we can figure that out really quickly. It was the West, I think it was the West Germans. West Germans. Is there, is there East and West, West Germans, Germans anymore? Not anymore. I mean, that's been gone for a while, But it was right? at, the, at the time. So, oh, I mean, this was... This back away. It's just for this over a decade, <laughs> but the, the wall's been down for over oh, a decade. Oh, I mean, this so. this started in the 1970s, if oh. not earlier. So so this isn't a decade. This is decades. This is yeah. multiple decades. The, oh, sorry, the wall's the 19- been down for over 30 years. Yep. Yes. The, uh, my understanding is this whole thing um, started in the 1950s. Interesting. That they yes. created some... Between the NSA and the CIA, uh, created the companies. Yes, it was the BND. Um to, but uh, you think about it, you created a company that far back in history. The, this is early days. Yeah, yeah, the lies can... When it was all mechanical. The, the, but the lies can kind of like be faded off mm-hmm. into history. So like, think about it, even if it was created in the 50s, 30 years later in the 80s, yeah. you're in Germany and you go work for this company... In, and, and it was a, and it was okay. a, it like was, I'm working for a company like I, 30 years ago that might have been the yeah. conspiracy it was, to create it it's right. just like the enigma was kept secret for and a long time because it was still in operations we and only saw the movie a few years ago because, because it finally it was got declass- declassified, it was finally right. declassified. And, and but this, for good for good reason and, and, yeah, I, I, uh, I want to back them up on that for absolutely absolutely good yeah, reasons yes. but but take that um, take the enigma analogy mm. now to oh. this right this is a front company that's been around for you know, 40 plus years, 50 plus years, um, being able to get into these encryption channels to spy and do other things. I mean, this was a uh, plan wait, a wait, long, long time uh, ago. Let me, re- I, I want to rephrase something for you. They didn't get into the cr- encryption channels. They were the They oh, were, they, they were the built, channel. they supplied the encryption channels to hundreds of governments, mm. including um, the, the opponents of the U.S., as well as some of the allies. And that was where sort of the BND started to fall out of this that stuff is that the U.S. made very little distinction about who got the insecure stuff and who got the non-backdoored stuff. It's like uh, that whole adage, like, keep your friends close, close but your enemies, enemies closer. closer. Except yes. in this case, it's just keep everyone close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep an so, eye on I mean, everyone. It's like sniff everyone's how packets. how long this has been running. Now yeah. think about it from our standpoint today. What companies are being established, set up? Primed, you know, fronted. What if, what if AWS is this company thirty years from now, yeah. fifty years from now. So like, my, m- yeah, but you know, my <coughs> my Facebook, <coughs> yeah, my big my big take on this was <laughs> they have been they they did this for you know fifty years or s- maybe even more. Yeah, uh, they were the supply chain for the crypto for all of these nation states, and they could read everything. Mm-hmm. Now, they had about an 80 to 90% success rate, depending on, because they still had to intercept it and be able to, they, they had a decryption, they, they could decrypt it absolutely. And um, they had huge data lakes to process all this data with no, machine no, learning and artificial yeah, intelligence. Yeah, data lake, a filing cabinet full of paper. <laughs> but the thing that is amazing to me is one of the things that where this started to fall off was they were in the mechanical 
crypto mm. and the electromechanical. What really started to drive <laughs> them out? Dare you say firmware? Yeah. Where, where, <laughs> what really started to go out of this? Uh, and dare I say firmware? Absolutely firmware. Where they started to fall out of this when all the encryption started to move to electronic. And that was sort of where the story end was like, yeah, they can't do this stuff anymore because it's all electronic. Sure they could. But can they? Sure they could. Like, uh, be because so now has history repeated itself and those... I just... I find, it, I find it fascinating that the secret nature is not the data that they were encrypting or mm -hmm. decrypting rather so much as it was that they had the ability to do this. Yeah. And this, this crops up every once well, in a while. Now, uh, looking back at the history... Uh, of Conficker, who I think it was the R in RSA. Yeah. Uh, Professor Revest Edelman and I can't Revest remember. created a uh, proposal Shlamazel. for an encryption algorithm, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Conficker A, I believe, adopted that. Mm. And this was not a very well publicized thing. This was a proposal that was very, very obscure, mm -hmm. and conceivably no one else had implemented it except the creators of the Conficker worm. Now, Reves realized that there was actually a cryptographic flaw in the original proposal, went back and created a next Second. version of yep. it. Well, lo and behold, the next version of, of Conficker Ficker. adopted that one. Mm. I thought that was probably the scariest thing when I looked in the history of Conficker. Mm. That, that I, and what was interesting is the, the team of people that included folks from New Star uh, and uh, universities and others, basically went to the government and said, we can get a hold of this back door, but we got to break the encryption. And the government was like, yeah, no. And yep. I firmly believe that the answer was no, because whether they could or could not wasn't really in question. It was if they could, that was the secret they were trying right. to protect, not the secrets or the protection we would have gained from taking down mm -hmm. Conficker, it was no one wants to admit that we can break this yeah. encryption. That's right. the secret. That's, that's the, the whole enigma problem. That's the and, enigma and that was problem. the whole problem right. with, with this stuff too is that you have to be very careful about how you use the intelligence that you've decrypted because you don't want to tip your hat to know that Mm -hmm. All of their stuff is compromised. Right. Yeah. Was it C Tech Astronomy? It, 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 yeah. If you go back to the RSA breach back in 2013, mm -hmm. no, 2011, 2012. Was that the, the RSA token? Yeah, yeah. token yeah. breach. That was uh, 11, 12. Right. That was mm -hmm. 2011, 2012 timeframe because that was right before I went to RSA. Part of the reason that attack happened was because they knew that a lot of that stuff was being used in the federal government and they want to try to, from a nation state perspective, get into that mm -hmm. stuff, right? Um, and so it doesn't surprise me that people were adopting that algorithm to try to figure out how to also circumvent the algorithm because it was one of the de facto ways of encrypting data in the early days. Um, I, we've this was we a newer algorithm after that time. This yes. was a newer algorithm uh -huh. proposed by Correct. Revest. Yeah. Yes, and, and the whole team that mm -hmm. ended up going. But... That was one of the, the, the rationales behind the breach was the ability to get into those secure ID tokens, leveraging that, mm -hmm. and, and then being able to get access to that, knowing that a lot of that was also embedded in the federal government. It's very interesting. Yep. So, so uh, I, will, oh, I will say this. And, and then Jeff, has, oh, and Jeff, Jeff, Jeff can speak. <laughs> and after Jeff, that, has, and, Jeff has the floor. And, Je and after that, I want to make a quick comment. So you're, you're touching on an, an important principle in terms of national security, which is the you know what makes something top secret or top secret compartmented is 99% not the information that's being shared. It's the uh, what we used to call methods and sources. It's how you got the information. And I think I've talked about this on the show before. You know, back in World War II, not only had we broken uh, the German Enigma machine, we'd also uh, broken the Japanese, I want to say it was called the Purple machine. Uh, and, and very shortly after Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, there was an intercept, and they figured out where uh, Yamamoto was going to, you know, what plane he was going to be and mm -hmm. what his flight path was. Um, and and they, con they concocted a way to sort of accidentally 
discover the plane and and were able to shoot them down but they they put a whole lot of effort into that we have to make this look like it's just sort of an accidental right coincidental and when we see a redaction in in a in a top secret report a lot of what is being protected is the method and the sources of how they got the data and but that's what scares me about the snowden leaks quite frankly is not so much the data is that in there was their disclosures of how we were collecting intelligence, which puts mm-hmm. national security at risk, yes. which puts people's lives uh, at risk. And a lot right? of hard not, work. No, no Paul, yeah. not just at risk. Snowden had people killed. Inadvertently, yeah. through his actions, people died. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's a Inadvertently? fact. Inadvertently? Period. Well, as a consequence. As a consequence. As a consequence. Yes. No, Tyler, because Tyler methods and sources were exposed, yep. right, but, not t- t- only what? to the data. Tyler didn't say consequence he didn't say inadvertently he said well and, and to put it in yeah. economic terms i mean you know it you know it's one thing to lose human life but it, it's another thing to to factor in the investment that the country made in in uh, cultivating and, and creating a source i mean you know there you know so it's not just human life which is how do you put a price tag on it? But it's also the tens, hundreds, and millions of dollars that are spent sort of cultivating a resource right. and, and right. It's setting that up. So, it, you know, if you're not comfortable with Snowden had people killed, Snowden cost the country millions of dollars in blowing up all the, the resources and having to, you know, retool and start over. And I, I, had, on I, had the opportunity, I, had, I had the opportunity to explain that to one of my children, right? And I forget how we got... On the topic, but basically, I took them to the page that shows in the CIA building all of the stars. I had to explain to him that you know there are people working to protect this country that gave their lives. That we can't even say who they were. We can't say anything other than they're depicted as a star, right? That was a really <laughs> kind of profound thing to you know explain to your children when you you kind of get on that. that we topic. had a. Uh... It's even more profound when you're you're you see it in person. We had like a like like I said like I I'm one of the organizers for Boston Security Meetup, and this is totally off topic. But one of the one of the other organizers is former Space Command NSA guy, and we had this meetup. You know, everyone's hanging out and drinking, and it's fun time, fun time. You're joking, talking about hacks and exploits. But one of the questions during this panel was, you know, what do you classify as Snowden as, right? And myself and him, we both had this almost the same, we don't agree on a lot, but the same thing. It was like, well, we can't say traitor, but in a sense traitor, because there was a lot of hard work that went into developing those capabilities Mm -hmm. and that technology that went out the window in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And once Mm -hmm. it's on the web, it's gone. The same it's thing gone. I'm it's looking gone. at, the same thing you're looking at from Pace. You got to retool, you got to recreate. All that re- went out the window. Recruit. So you have to believe that people got hurt and behind I, that. And I tell you what, regardless of where you fall on the Snowden thing, you should absolutely listen to the interview that Matt and I did with mm-hmm. what was what was his name? Uh, Snowden's, uh, Snowden's, uh, Lee? Snowden's Lee. Spot. Lee. Stephen, Stephen Bay. Bay. Stephen Bay was, was his boss. His boss. Direct report. Yeah, the guy Snowden. that plays Nicolas Cage in the movie. Yeah, was his well. We talk about. <laughs> I just remember. We talk about yeah. the, the some of the. In, you got to listen to the interview. <laughs> ESW 170. Stephen Bay will. Uh, you should educate yourself on that particular situation and see that side uh, of what happened with with because this one. Like, it, if you think about it, right? You think story. about red flags, and he's like, "Look, at the time there were no red flags, mm. but now hindsight 2020." Now I see the red flags, but I mean, the story is so compelling to think about how well crafted his story was mm. to do what he did and how really intelligent people, right? I- including his boss, didn't see the signs at the time. Boss, co-workers, I mean, no oh one my really gosh. had nothing. I mean, nothing. You have to imagine you want, the interviews want... that took place after oh, they figured yeah. out it was Snowden, right? You get a firsthand account in ESW 170 of what transpired after they figured out like, they were actually in a bar drinking, joking, like, ah, oh, like, what if that was Ed? They call him Ed. Like, what if, what if that was Ed? Think about the people you work with, right? And yeah. what if they and were to be one of the most people were worried about major? his safety, his actual well-being. Genuinely the concerned story, about his safety. Because the well, you story don't know it's of his health and epilepsy, so. and they thought he literally drove off a cliff, potentially, in Hawaii and was dead. That's how... They were worried about his safety, but yet at the whole time the story was so crafted. I mean, the, the, the con that happened 
as part of that whole story. It's just amazing to hear. We want to bring Steve on this on the show as well because like, yeah, he was just so. oh, amazing. Yeah. Lee, thank you for that. That was yeah. one oh, of the most my, amazing my interviews pleasure. we've ever done. I, I really was fortunate to meet Steve and and talk to him about what he was doing. It's like just sitting down and talking to him over dinner. It was like holy crap, this is a hell of a story. We had the um, same thing when we were doing the interview, Lee. This this is how emotional it was. I mean, this guy lost his child. Like, his fourth child, his wife had a miscarriage in Japan, like, literally, like, a week or two weeks before this whole thing went down. And he still describes the worst day in his life is the Edward Snowden thing, and he lost a child. I mean, it's, it's, it's a heart-wrenching, mm. emotional discussion. Yeah. Matt and I both were just holding back tears, like, the entire time. Like, that's how. Wow. You should definitely check right. out that interview. Is uh, so, and unique the, the other thing, O'Shea, if you want a really good story about what insider threat is like... It's really good because you're not sitting here. He's not judging Ed or not. I mean, he's he's not going to go up and give Ed a big hug if he sees him again. Yeah, quite but the opposite is what he describes. Yeah, it, yeah. it makes it imagine. real. And I actually um, had him come out and talk to the lab at one of, at our our cyber event just to kind of tell the story because it it gives a completely different perspective on the whole topic of insider threat. Mm-hmm. Yes, it makes it real. But also, yep. if you've been in a role like government, like I, I worked at DOE at one point, and we had at least two incidents where we walk in, and all of a sudden there's investigators there, and it's like, congratulations, everybody's getting polygraphed today. And it's like, yep. what, that, what oh, the hell happened? What? It's like, s- someone <laughs> did something. In there. Yeah, it's horrible. And it's also like, damn, is this someone I just had drinks with last night? Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. Once you go through that exactly. thing, you're like, is this right. someone I was just yep. hanging out with? This and is a guy you- who lost a child, not no more than Less two than weeks week. before. Yeah. Less than a week. Like, And then he's in an interrogation room with the FBI and CIA yeah. and all these yeah. people. It's like, could you oh, imagine? Shit. Oh, my God. Yeah. No. I, so to, to bring this to bring this full circle so we can move on. To move other, on. Other I do stories. want to move on to Docker registries, but, yes. But my, <laughs> my, my prediction, or looking at history, and those who don't learn from history are destined to repeat itself. Look at the history in that there have been government actors involved in in crypto systems that are used by nation states and or potentially others that the story has come out that things changed when everything went digital that they weren't able to be in this stream if you think that some nation state isn't in the stream mean like a firmware you, supply chain chain in the stream in anywhere in the stream in the encryption stream yeah. supply supply firmware you name mm-hmm. it well, you're de- you're de- and the, you're and the, go ahead. I'm sorry. The important lesson, Larry, there is don't cross the streams. Yes. yes. So if you don't think that someone is continuing to be in the stream based on what we've seen in history, you're deluding yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, I, which last, last final thought is that I wonder now if this whole push in the U.S. to enable, quote, backdoors in encryption is an attempt to legitimize what has already happened. Well, and that's been happening since. And we saw it in Australia, right? right. And in other places. They're still fighting in Australia, though. I know, but I'm telling you, this is where we're seeing the trends is creating these backdoors into encryption algorithms. There's still a big (laughs) fight between the U.S. government and Apple on Uh getting access to some of this data. The the question is do they already have it? Do they need to create it, or are they just using this legislation to legitimize what they already have? Hmm. Interesting. Mm. That. Do they need to create it when people open up their S3 buckets or misconfigure <laughs> their Docker registries too? No. Nope. Le- leaky secrets. <laughs> I, so I have a, 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 a technical question as it relates to this misconfigured Docker registries. And this was research done by Palo Alto. Um, and Probably through the Twistlock acquisition, I would imagine. I would imagine. So uh, source code tags, malicious actors can design tailored exploits to compromise systems by gaining access to an exposed Docker registry. If push operations are allowed, benign application images may be replaced with back doors. You better hope you have the capabilities to detect that behavior. Um, they could be used for hosting malware. Uh, they could delete or encrypt the images and ask for a ransom. Now, in the post, they say they found 941 exposed Docker registries. When I ran the same search on Shodan, I found 940 exposed 
DACA registries. We're only off by now, one. So That's that means good. one one organization read this and go, oh shit, we got to close down our DACA registry, <laughs> right? But that, and my my technical question is, it was a very specific <coughs> string that they were looking for and showed in to come up with that 941, which is now 940 number. Does that also include registries that are provided by Amazon's ECR? and Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud and others? Or, it, it, t Tyler, you're, you're shaking your head. Is this, there are more registry, there are more than 940 registries exposed today, right? These are just Docker ones. Tyler, you're muted. Oh, you're muted, buddy. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's definitely got to be more than, more than that, just based on, you know, what we know about how Docker's being deployed and... The services that are deploying these, um, I'm assuming, based on some of the scans that I'm looking at right now, um, like these right are outside now? of the regular providers, right? Like these are the ones that are not providing you anything additional. So I'm assuming that there is a way to look at different strings across different service providers to provide a very similar result for registries. Because right. this wouldn't be, it would not be limited to DTR. It would be potentially ECR. And it would be any private registry potentially. Right. That's it's being like hosted. I, I can have done this, created my own registry. Yeah. Which With I mean, Quay or not something like else. But yes. recommended. I mean, if you like, you want a weekend project. I mean, it's not all that fun uh, to set up your own Docker registry. <laughs> like, if I compare that to standing up my own ECR instance, mm -hmm. like it's totally night, night and day. Now, when you do. Uh, create your own registry as we were talking before like in, in AWS I think you have uh, an easier facility even though the interface is kind of clunky to right. be able to secure that but like it's all on you when you stand up your own registry, registry. to have those Correct. you have to have a certificate you have to like there's steps you have to take in order to do that this is also independent of your Docker API which can also be exposed where you can from the descriptions of what they just listed here, you don't need access to the registry. Nope, no. If you get access to the Docker API, you can do all the same stuff. And something to, if you rewind about two years ago when that big Elastic, uh, that big Elastic uh, breach happened, right? So it wasn't really a breach. It was just they found like, what, 1.2, 1.3 million different instances of Elastic search running on AWS or running yep. within cloud environments with all default credentials. Yep. Uh, Docker has uh, default, default ports that it runs on. Mm -hmm also has default admin credentials too. Uh, how many people are still leveraging the that? Defaults. So maybe not as much as Elasticsearch, right? But from a Docker perspective, do you really need to control the whole instance, right? You just need a hook into the dependency. Right. This is what I was going towards earlier in regards to like making these images and deploying them into AWS. I don't need to like poison all of Docker. I just need to poison whatever version of Java you're leveraging, whatever version of Python you're leveraging. Maybe or it's, PHP it's, it's, even better. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> running, you're a star. You're a star in the night book. But if you're running these these super vulnerable uh, code bases or these super vulnerable dependencies, that's really all you really need to poison the rest of the bucket, right? Yep. And it's it, it's it's horrible to say it out loud, but because it's not, it's not all, that difficult. <laughs> because they're all dynamically linked libraries. Yes, and it's not At that hard. At the end of the or, day, they're all dynamically or, linked libraries. And so when you have a dynamic linked library set up in, in, configured in these environments, it's pulling the latest and greatest dependencies, which may or may not be vulnerable. Um, there's a lot of ways into this. I mean, a lot of the work that you have done yeah, around well. looking at vulnerabilities. I mean, Paul has spent a lot of time in our environment looking at, do I pull the Debian distribution or do I build my own? And do I use Buster Slim and this, that, and the other yeah, thing? Like how deep into inception do you want to go? So I pulled <sighs> Debian Slim. Buster Slim is my base Docker image to build my applications. A couple of issues with that. If I want to go deeper down the inception rabbit hole, then I have to build basically my own Linux distribution to build mm -hmm. my base Docker image. I don't know if I want that level of responsibility, <laughs> um, but I do gain a lot of control. So where I've kind of balanced that, and this can really fall down, is I'm going to trust that Buster Slim, which is what a lot of other images are, are built upon, that they're doing a good job with security, that they're monitoring to make sure there's no back doors in that. Then, as I add on other software, this could be libraries from Python or Node.js. This could be, I have wget commands that are going to get 
a tarball to install software. Yep. I'm verifying the cryptographic hash of that, and then I'm installing that software. If I make a mistake or don't include the right level of checking when I'm building my image, I could be introducing a backdoor. So, like, wh where do you, I mean, I'm putting the, uh, you know, I only trust trusted Docker images. There's a setting in uh, an environment variable Correct. that says basically only trust trusted Docker images. I'm doing that. I'm pulling Buster Slim and I'm building all my own images going to my own registry. I have to make sure that I'm verifying everything I'm putting in my image and verifying that I'm securing my own registry. And removing that. dependencies that you don't need at runtime, like curl and yes. shadow and Correct. all this other stuff that's embedded in these in I, these dependencies. I had a really funny tweet this week, and uh, it was a uh, pillow talk between my wife and I. Larry used to have a pillow talk radio, right? Pillow talk radio. This is a hilarious pillow talk. <laughs> okay. and I'm like, you know, I said I had a really good day technically. I'm like, I did my first multi-stage Docker build. Now, my, my wife is not in uh, IT or, or security, right? And she looks me square in the eye and she says, I scanned someone's balls today. She's an ultrasound <laughs> technician. <laughs> right? Like, that's, that's our day. In a nutshell, <laughs> in a tweet right there, that's our day. So how do you feel, your, feel about your wife handling another man's balls? I, you, know, you, come, you come to terms. <laughs> yeah, you, you, she's a medical. Oh, you come? She doesn't love those balls. Medical <laughs> professional. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Totally. But something that actually is cool that I've been wanting to try out, which I probably won't because I don't know where it will lead. But the default Docker port is like uh, five four. It's it's a four digit number. It's a default Docker port. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the registry port is five thousand. Yeah, yes. The thank Docker you. API port is a. Di uh, that I don't it, remember. We need the talking. API port, but the API port is where you can use to authenticate into a specific instance or into a specific image. So Correct. what does it take to repoint from a DNS registry perspective on that specific image into your own? I have yep. my own. Malicious. My, I have my own instance registry, running. Yeah. I have my own. I have my own uh, Ubuntu server running, and this is now your registry for Docker, right? So this is where you're getting your images. What does it it's take true. for me to do that, and then just load a shitload of crazy Java? Well, the other and thing then let too, them pull it or down. PHP, or Python PHP libraries. Or, but I the mean, other thing on. too is if I'm able to pull images from someone's private repository, air quotes private repository. Right. Uh, if I do analysis on that image, I think it go, I don't know if it was on air or off air. We were talking about where you put secrets, right? <laughs> yeah, there's <it> artifacts <laughs> in, your, in your bum. <laughs> there's artifacts in those images that could be very beneficial to attackers. They on air, by the way. Oh, yeah. It was Dot on .emv air. files, yes. Yeah. Your environmental uh, files, yes. Yeah. 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 So that that was also kind of kind of scary. I've brought these you secrets for you. They're up in my yeah, bum. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or hanging off my ball. In my right .env file. 2375 and 6. 2375. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. 2375 <laughs> is the Docker Gotta API love port. people who are on Google. But the scary the thing time. would be if you could, because that's a quick short answer. It doesn't take much to get that. But if so, let's say I'm in some, like, a good example. I was in, uh, I was, I was like, uh, I was in Canon. Like, I was, I was, uh, like, two weeks ago, I was snowboarding around Canon. And the lodge we were at, the, the internet just totally went down. And like just totally joking around with one of the guys that's with me that's organizing ski con, we're like, I don't know if we can just stand up a quick ISV right now and just start rerouting the traffic to like wherever, right? And we looked at a couple of the DNS services, like mostly unauthenticated stuff, and it wouldn't be that hard to pop into it. So if we can get into there and push all traffic directly to our boxes, mm -hmm. what can we push from a download perspective directly to any user's phone from an SDK perspective <coughs> or from laptops? Not that I would do it, wouldn't do it, but just like a could scary do it. Mm -hmm. It was a thought exercise. Yes. Yes. This is hypothetical. Yeah. Just I love. I see Tyler smiling. <laughs> I love thought smile. exercises. Actually, Tyler's I think Tyler... like, wait, that's one of my techniques. Don't, <laughs> dis Tyler, don't disclose I think Tyler's it. Tyler's actually frozen, but it's, oh, <laughs> it's frozen with the creepiest smile ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there he goes. Oh, he's um, back. Oh, he's and back. then now the creepy smile is also back. <laughs> so there is I, no good that's, internet that's in Idaho, bad. is what I'm telling you right now. But I, it's, you know, he's perfectly fine. He's I mean, in Idaho. basically, what we're talking about is a level of trust that's been kind of a, mm. a theme for this show and many and many other shows that we've done, right? And my story number five really also breaks down this trust chain in that there's what they dub as a forgotten motherboard driver uh, for Gigabyte. And they say mm. that it's being used as a wedge because this forgotten about driver is, uh, I don't know if the attackers are loading this driver or if the driver already exists 
but they're using it as a shim so they can load another driver that lets them bypass any kind of protections that are installed in the operating system, like uh, they mentioned endpoint security uh, and tamper uh, protection once they get on a system. Uh, Firmware. Ty Tyler, oh. uh, I don't know if you saw this story, but I know this is right up your alley. Uh, are, are they loading the driver? Like, if, are they recognized they have a gigabyte motherboard and loading the driver, or does it already have to be there? No, I'm pretty sure they're leveraging the driver. They've rewritten that as kind of a stub, and they're leveraging the signing of that driver. Which is still valid. Uh, yep. That's valid, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, there's, you know, this isn't the first time that you've you've seen this uh, used, and there's there's a couple other public ones that have been abused over the years, but this one is kind of obscure and it's still in play, um, which is kind of interesting. I actually haven't read the story at all, but yeah, it is uh, it is a known technique and it's definitely one that that we use often. Yep. And do, very, do very they useful. need to revoke the certificate sign, the, uh, the certificate that's used to sign this particular driver, or do they need to update it? Because if I still have a gigabyte motherboard and I need this driver, it still needs to be signed to run on my operating system, right? They have to up, update it and re-sign it. Right? Yeah. With a, they basically have to revoke that, that signing. Gotcha. Back to firmware. Which, again, can break a lot, of, a lot of stuff, so it is not one of those things that manufacturers like to do. However, oh, is that because if I have that happen, it's, it's a bad day. If I have the original driver and they revoke the certificate, that means my driver is not valid anymore. I have to go update my driver to get the new signed certificate. Yep. Yep. Which can cause instabilities in the hardware and the performance of the hardware, right? If the operating system then revokes the signing of that driver and that driver's loading yeah. uh, as part of the OS, then that yeah, driver that's a won't load. Now you go to 100, that's a problem. 100 meg instead of 1 gig. Or, or, it, yeah, will, or it will load and you have to hold, click a whole bunch of buttons to say, yeah, no, I really want this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or if Windows even allows that, right? Because right. you're talking about things that if it's you know one of the Southbridge chips or a Northbridge chip, you're talking about things that control like TPM or bridging into a USB bus or the initialization of your graphics card. Bus. I was going to so, say your graphics card is probably the worst case scenario because then you can't see anything that's happening on right. the system. That would really suck. I mean, your network driver, yeah, all right. But then you got to go to another system to get the network driver, right, or use the wireless driver if it's the Ethernet driver or vice versa. Jeff? I just want to move on. Can I, can I do one? Can yeah, I do yeah. one? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was looking through right. your stories, Jeff. And what? What do you got? For, first off, you know, just real quickly, um, today is the start of the uh, social media campaign called the End It Movement, trying to raise awareness of uh, slavery all over the world, which is a lot of human trafficking, sex trafficking, uh, traffic involving minors. So just uh, want to acknowledge that because I'm involved in, I've been involved in this movement for several, trying to end it, to point that out, for several years. Um, the theme of my stories are kind of like, you know, major breach, millions of records lost, major breach, millions of records lost. Uh, a report came out last year was the worst on record for breaches, data exposure. Um, and my comment is, you know, so so what are we accomplishing here? What are we doing? What are we what uh, are we accomplishing? I think your story number eight sums it up. Yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is uh, the title yeah. you put in was security professionals are overconfident in the effectiveness on their security tools. Because they're right. not leveraging PCI for the full <laughs> oh scope God. of PCI. <laughs> they're, they're PCI and and stop compartmentalizing and scoping out aspects of PCI. And they Just be, do it holistically. And they should be using Did I machine, sum that up right, and they, should, and they should be using AI and machine learning. Pretty much. I, yep. I, 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 I just want to throw hmm. out there that there is nothing better that curbs that overconfidence than a really good pen test. True. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I mean, yeah. You know, I'll, st I'll stand behind that. I mean, I remember oh, working yeah. for a large lottery company, right? And us feeling pretty good about our security. And, you know, other people coming in going, hey, we could, we could hire we someone that could, just, you. Yeah, that could just shatter your security. Oh. And we're but like, nobody wants to pay for that, so they wait and get breached. Right. Yeah. And it, but that overconfidence uh, it can hurt you. I think one of the benefits that we had, and I think advantages, was, yes, you might breach us, but we're going to detect you pretty quick. Mm -hmm. now, now, this is like almost 20 years ago when we really had a good handle 
on the traffic, right? There was two security engineers. It was easier then. We had a data center. We had a perimeter. We had data center. We had servers. We, we knew where our internet points were. We had monitoring Ingress systems. Ingress and egress on. points. Not, and not we, only I mean, that. We had the not world's not largest that. Tor exit node. No, this was <laughs> before. This was before that. Not only that, we also had Nortons, and we could like look oh at the gosh. contents of your hard drive, oh, like you know, visually by hand. But we, I mean, we had uh, we had ago. Snort, we had Flow, and we were looking at that, and we could get a pretty good hand. Not to say someone couldn't slip in unnoticed. I'm not saying that we're 100 uh, percent effective, right? But like at some point, we felt pretty confident that we would eventually find some kind of nefarious traffic on our on our network, right? That was very short-lived, right? The explosion, I think it was like VMware uh, and the proliferation of the internet and everyone has a device now that they have separate internet that we can't monitor mm -hmm. that basically shattered that. Like in our insights into the network were good for some time to maybe allow us to detect things, but now you fast forward to today, I think that's the reason why you still find that overconfidence and you find all these breaches is because with everyone spinning up infrastructure all over the place and the connectivity is off the charts. Every single I, I, device I, that you have has connectivity, whether you're on an airplane, whether you've got 4G, whether you, you're wherever, right? Right. So if you think about where securities of, you know, kind of come through its phases, we thought we could do it at the perimeter with firewalls. We could do it with IDS and, and IPS. Yeah. Right then, we could do it at the endpoint. Mm -hmm. Th that's completely shattered. Com shattered. Yes. It's it's upside down. Right, the perimeter vanishes. The endpoints are everywhere. How how do it, I we, mean, like we said my, earlier, I but, might even know where the, the endpoint is anymore because it's in the cloud somewhere. Right, there's no endpoint. The, I don't have a there's system. A, there's a there, there's a deeper, more root cause to what you're describing, Matt. I agree with you, but the the which the the number eight story on my list reflects the the underlying root cause is the belief that oh I can do security I just have to buy the right tool or the right number of tools and and I contend that no amount of automation is ever going to solve this no. problem. Right. I I mean obviously I mean in a large enterprise. You're running 50, 70, maybe even 100 different tools to try to do this, right? And we talked a little bit about this, I think, earlier today about, what's that? Oh, oh it was one of my advisory calls. Um, there's no single source of record. Think about how you have to integrate 50, 75, 100 different security tools together. And you live this, right? Uh, On a I daily have, basis, a this I'll, is I'll hard, next, right? I mean, integrating all that stuff together and really giving yourself a, a way to centralize all that data to look at the stuff in a way that you can respond to it effectively, that's still a very difficult challenge in organizations. It is, but if you were to... You can extract like this out, and you can bring you can you can talk about BYOD, or you can talk about all these other devices that that have access into your your network, or that may ha that may have a hook into your systems. The reality of it, I'm only speaking from a defensive standpoint, from just you know a guy that's only done defense his whole life, so I'm a weirdo. There's only a few hooks into what you consider really sensitive, right? So if I have machines that process credit card data, if I have machines that hold formulas, or I have machines that have a big client list. There should only be a very, very small amount of individuals that have access into that. If I can monitor, and this is the hard part, and I'm not. I, I I'm wish not that were the case, easy. but Excel spreadsheets still exist. No, but, you if know, you, but but if you think about it from a DB perspective, or we'll say a DB perspective, right? If you have this, a couple of my MySQL instances that you know, this DBA should have access to, this DBA should have access to, a couple of sysadmins. Maybe our CTO, if he's a still technical or whatnot, you limit that down to maybe like 10% of your scope, 10% of your scope being like 10% of the individuals in IT or your R&D or, or engineering department. And you focus heavily on that and you pull back or you scale backwards in regards to what that access looks like, what controls are in place, what's the normality behind that and then begin to move backwards. The problem is like everyone buys tools and the tools are forward facing. Yeah. This is like the fuck up, excuse my language, but this is like the fuck up when it comes to like majority of the tools that we sell. We sell tools, not we, I don't, I don't sell tools, but most of the tools that are sold from an EDR solution or from a next gen perspective or whatever it may be are focused on entry of entry points. So this is the attack vector. This is how they're going to enter. We can catch all these SQL attempts. We can catch all this malicious malware. We can catch all this shit. But the problem is once they're inside, but, we fail. But that oh, means you have a really good understanding of data 
user uh, under, data. data inventory and classification to be able to do that. And that's yes. not easy for a lot of organizations. No. Part, part of my but hold on. Pardon, pardon, my, pardon my metaphor. That's like putting a Band-Aid on your butthole, but next thing you know, you find a Band-Aid inside your butthole. No, but <laughs> what, I, well, shit, what I think you're saying is that... <laughs> Band-Aids on the buttholes, first off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that. You gotta go. They gotta stop pooping diet. (laughs) If we look at uh, and and (laughs) Matt's the first one to point this out. If we look at users, apps, and data, those are the entry points we need to secure. And Osha, what I hear you saying is something is a belief that I share is that many of the solutions are focused on the attack vectors and other entry points, and not allowing us to control and gain visibility into. Who are the users? What are they doing? What are the applications? And, and what, what are they data doing? And what data they are they accessing? Yeah. Right? And, and that, that's yeah. really where I think today we get to the core of how we do security is looking at the user, the users, the apps, and the data, and how we apply visibility and controls to those three things. We break it down on a basic level. So many solutions today are very focused on how do I stop this particular attack path? That really Correct. is independent of... How do I make sure that these users are the ones that have access to this application? This application has these controls, and this data is what the applications and these users have access to. And the best way I summarize, like I'm, I'm sure many of you have been involved, like incident, incident response investigations, right? Like I've done a shitload of IR investigations. When I see Xfil or when I see something grab, it's not magic. It's not something special. It's not a zero day. It's usually the back access off of another user's uh, another user's Credentials, access. Yep or it's access from another system. If we know the normalization of the behavior around those systems, we should be able to catch it. Not to say we'll stop it, because I think it's, uh, I think it's damn near impossible Prevention's to stop it. Prevention's very difficult. It's, I think it's damn near impossible, in my opinion. But identification and monitoring and that alerting in real time is what's key. Because but yeah, maybe you get 5% of my data out, but you're not the, getting 100% of The triad of, data of application user data access- It's hard as fuck. Is hard, but that's where I think the, the industry has to really focus more because that's where the jewels get exposed. It's yeah. user credentials gaining access to applications or data that they shouldn't have, therefore leveraging an attack that exfils data. But well, this right. requires exposed- you to understand your data for classification. Yes, and right. This is where data, class- data classification becomes kind of convoluted because a lot of people think of it as, well, we have sensitive data and that's what's in PCI and then we have non-sensitive data, what's outside of PCI. I right. was like, you need to go a bit deeper and start tagging records Oh, Jeff is of loving what you're but saying. It's, right it's, it's, no, <laughs> there's nothing outside of PCI. What are you talking about? <laughs> but it's what uh, an exposed S3 bucket is a prime example of that. You've lost sight of, well, what users should have access to my data? You've basically said, well, everyone does. Right, the application is almost independent of the app. I mean, S3 is a component of your application, right? And something you need to control if your application yeah. is writing data to an S3 bucket, that's part of your application controls. And then it comes down to data. What is the classification of that data that we're putting in this S3 bucket? What applications should have access to it and what users? Obviously it's Wait, not- you have that? You have yeah, that? Yeah, obviously it's not every application can write to the public S3 bucket that every single user on the entire planet can access, right? This is true. And when we saw that it was a kind of a, a yawn story because it just made me yawn because it's every <laughs> data breach, right? Jail software left uh, inmate data exposed online. I'm like, well, that sounds kind of interesting. And then it's like, well, yeah, they basically left this data in an exposed S3 bucket. I'm like, well, right. hello, welcome to 2020. If you're not understanding the controls inside of your cloud provider, which is now AWS, you better make sure that you have people that do and tools that can help you realize where your exposures are. Those tools exist today, right? I think yeah. it's the skill set, maybe, perhaps, uh, that, that could be lacking. You I can, can, all the tool- can go like and, a year about this, about right? the skill and set part. point, <laughs> we can adopt all these tools and have confidence, but if we don't have the expertise and we don't have the processes to understand yeah. first data classification, then uh, you can have all the tools in the world and it doesn't matter. No, no it doesn't matter. Also, a weird, a weird tidbit, if you ever like, hacked anything that relates to judicial systems, especially jail cells, or jail systems, sorry, like uh, they incorporate the phone calls into uh, data for like, user data for like uh, inmates. So like user inmates of like in the 90s or whatever, it was just the mail they had or the collect call they received because uh, uh, 
telecom vendors would give them. Mm -hmm. Here are the records of this individual, whatever. Totally against your civil liberties or whatever. But now they just record it and digitally and keep that into like an encapsulation of like an actual record. So if you were to pop, like let's say you were worried about someone riding on you that goes to jail, just hack the prison and listen to the phone calls they have going in and out. Because they actually record the phone calls and encapsulate that into like a, an inmate's record. Yep. <laughs> Paul, we, we have a story about that. Or something similar. Well, yeah, that's the S3 bucket that is left it? Uh, data exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I mean. Like at one point, okay. it, that wasn't included, but now it's like they actually data, like there's data, like digital records of voice recordings of like phone calls, and they put that into like yep. a user. It, it's, it, it's, it, it's, mer it's merely a data field in a SQL database. Which is the same database you pay or add funds to for their commissary or, mm -hmm. you know, inmate. And exposed uh, globally card. on the internet. <laughs> yes, that's you're, open you're paying for really their spine. It's, I mean, it's like you thought it was ramen line. noodles, but it's spine. <laughs> and it, there's a long history of uh, insecurity in this particular environment. In fact, who was the, and I believe he passed away. He did. Um, John Strauch. John Stra Strauch. Yep, he uh, was the... Technical T advisor. Tiffany, Tiffany Rad's dad. Tiffany Rad's dad was the technical advisor to the movie Sneakers. His day job was providing security advice and penetration testing, essentially, to prison systems. Mm -hmm. As an interesting kind Fun of fact. tidbit All right. in history. <laughs> and was on Ooh. one of our previous he was. Uh, episodes. We had the opportunity to interview him. Yep. And, wow. and Tiffany as well. Yeah. Yep, um, and and they did a couple presentations together, actually, father and daughter, yeah. about the security of prison systems. This was, you know, this is a number of years ago, but now fast forward to today, and th it's still yeah, yeah, as we've it's identified. Still there. It's, still it's, it's, it's not a whole lot about the ladder logic in this case. It's about the unsecured S three bucket. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I st I still think the old set it up securely, now turn it all off because it didn't work. Mantra is still out there. I mean. But we're not with the safety of our own private data center anymore. We're out in the cloud where it's all reachable. I mean, yeah, but I, just, I remember years ago, it, I tried to set up things to be securely, and then they didn't work, so you turned it off, and it started working, and mm -hmm. you didn't always go back. Yep. Yeah. No, and, and I think it's harder in the cloud, Lee. I mean, when you think about oh, it. But at the same time, it's the same thing. It's right? the same it's thing. It's, just, it's somebody yeah. else's problem. No, but well, it's still no, your, but it's your not. problem. <laughs> you app user it. data. App user data is still the responsibility of the organization. I don't care what service provider. I don't care what SaaS provider you have. Application user and data is still in scope for every single enterprise. You cannot pwn that off. That's why I think app user data, <laughs> to get on a rant for a second, is so critical and we haven't focused on it enough as an industry because those are the things that transcend cloud computing. It doesn't matter where the infrastructure run, app user data is still the core fundamentals of how I secure an environment, but we're all focused on the network, we're all focused at the endpoint, we're all focused on all this other stuff. But look, at the end of the day, it's how does a user get access to an application and to data at the end of the day? Those are the three components that still matter, and they will matter oh, yeah. for a long, and long it, time. In AWS, it, it is different in that I think traditionally we had firewalls we could apply rules to, right? When we right. put that up in the cloud, now we've got security groups, and we've got mm -hmm. IAM roles, and we have policies, and we and have the, and multiple ways to control the trust model between users and, apps and data and in the cloud which makes it very complex and, and it's a whole, and, and not to mention it's mm -hmm. an entirely different language yes that you have to try to map the language from their setup like your your trust to what we used to do store, like what what's like, an acl uh, in amazon it, it's, it's a, a policy it's, it's, it's a, a policy, security right? group yeah, security a security, security group right yep. yeah mean, but it goes deeper your than point, that and you can, and you can only have so in, in your free tier you can only have so, so many security, security group points for your internet gateway yeah. the, but yeah. you, internet gateway is the key really if you can Correct. if you fuck up the internet gateway the security group is it doesn't really matter excuse me <laughs> <my You're> <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really matter you don't need to you're good you're a good company baby you can attach in a gateway what did what did you call that again uh, internet, the internet gateway, uh, internet to, your gateway to, to a VPC that can yes. bypass your security Correct. group. Correct. So the yes. internet gateway is a key, but that's another. Going back to their documentation, right. that's the thing they don't. They don't say like, this is the most important right. part of all of this. Like, and, and, don't worry about your VPC. And don't worry about your There's multiple ways right. and, and in, don't get me wrong. in and out of the cloud. Yeah, right. It's essentially what we're you, establishing. You, you pay, before you pay you extra gotta, for that internet gateway, don't you? 
You, you get one. Yeah. I think I think you get one uh, attached to each one of your accounts. I think I it's one I, or two. I, I rest my so, case. So, it's so confu- you, you have but to. Then, shit's but confusing. Then, but then you also it's have a, confusing. You have elastic IPs too. Yes. But those are controlled by security groups. Again, this is why I rest so my fucking case. Right? It's why it's <laughs> right. so complicated. It's but translating what prosecution you rests. Yeah. <laughs> so think about this. In your early days, my early days, we thought about ACLs and firewall rules and et cetera. That's a different terminology of what we used to do on-prem versus what they call it in the cloud. And how do you translate these these concepts yeah. of access control lists and firewall rules into cloud speak to know where do I configure this shit, right? Yeah, I yeah, guess look at the people at Squirrel. <laughs> like talk to the people at Squirrel that Amazon bought and, 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 and let and them and let them figure out. They, I, I, they bought I, a crap load of IR people. I mean, yeah. not not Amazon bought IR, but they bought Squirrel. So Squirrel did amazing work from IR threat hunting from an Intel perspective, and now they have that under their umbrella. So they have. People like Ryan Nolet and like, like some awesome but, fucking people. Yeah, so right. it's like, but those people are f- are few and far between. In very my belief. few. So here's the th- oh. like uh, uh, last week or the week before, right? Like I've got over 20 years of networking experience, right? Marson has several years of development experience. Just got his uh, uh, one of his Amazon AWS certifications today, right? And him and I are working on. Like, how do we configure this, right? And he's like, I don't really know networking. I'm like, I, I know networking. And he's like, we're both learning AWS. And it took us hours to figure out, like, where to add a default route. I mean, if that's not telling as I, to I how <laughs> complex it I, is I'm, to get stuff working, which is one thing, and then apply the appropriate controls, which is a completely oh. different thing, that that's uh, it's just it was my it was a, a a moment in time that we spent you know Marcin and I going we have all this experience and yes it transfers to the cloud but it's really complex Jeff so then on top of that oh take uh, the, wait Lee take you're not Jeff hold on Jeff <laughs> <laughs> I mean I mean you're sexy right, yeah. you're sexy we all, love but... you Lee but hold on Jeff and then Lee. So it, it, it's interesting what you're bringing up here, and and I'm thinking back. I I, I thought much about the uh, tech segment that you did last week, yeah, uh, Paul, on you know your adventures in AWS computing, uh, mostly because I was terribly like lost in all of it because it's all Greek to me. But th- the one thing that I was thinking about was it almost seems like, uh, you know, traditional. Uh, uh, professions or, or, or areas of expertise in terms of networking, network management, uh, you know, firewall re- administrators, router administrators. It seems like all of that is giving way, uh, and I could be making a, a false assumption, but what it looked like was you just need to learn how to code and learn how to program and do it in a different way because you made several references to true. It's a great well, point. you know, firewall rules, it's done over here and it's lines of code now uh and and, and I, I just an observation you know i don't know if if you would agree or disagree anyone but it, it seems like our industry in the move to the cloud and the move to uh, you know containers and all that it seems like uh programmers or encoders are winning and everybody else is is you know sort of becoming I- immaterial and yet as we're just pointing out, some of this, you know, the institutional knowledge that you have that you were just describing, you had a hard time translating it. I'm not convinced that the people that know how to code in AWS and Kubernetes and containers and all that have all the background and knowledge that you guys have, that we have in terms of networking. So the likelihood that they're doing what they, you know that they should be doing, but you don't know how to, What's the likelihood that they who know how to do it are actually doing it? Well, and Jeff, I, I think you're you're spot on, right? And it's a hard thing to kind of like summarize, right? But mm-hmm. developers know how to code. They may lack some of the knowledge in the network and security realm, but they're able to make things work and push things out at a very rapid rate. We as network and security professionals have that traditional knowledge and are having trouble translating that into cloud speak and infrastructure as code and DevOps, and, and, all, and, DevOps yeah. and all of these new technologies. So what we what we have here 
is a failure to communicate. Communicate. Right? It's right. Yeah. It is really what? hard for us to we come together and yeah. say, wow, developers, you're awesome at coding and you can write code that spins up infrastructure and traditional network security people are like, I'm having a tough time translating what we know as traditional network and security people into this new architecture. We really have to come together and work together to do that knowledge transfer so that the developers have more network and security knowledge and network and security people have more knowledge of how to right. code, which ultimately is now building your infrastructure and all of your security controls in the cloud. Can I, it's a great own. point, Jeff. It's well, a great point. So, uh, well, and to sum this up, and, and and this is a little bit of a plug for, I think it's next week, we're interviewing Ian Coldwater. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. I met Ian oh, awesome. last year at a, I think I met her for the first time at B-Sides Northern Virginia. She was keynoting and she made a comment up about PCI, which was wrong. So I confronted her afterwards. No, get and, out. And Never. Right no. Confronted someone who you thought was wrong about PCI. Surprise. But uh, and the next time I saw her, because you know we 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 Cross showed up at the again. same conference yeah. several several times sure. last year. Uh, the next time I heard her speak, which I think was B sides Orlando, right before Infosec World, she had corrected her statement, and 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 it wasn't a big deal. She just made one of the common misconception types of statements about PCI. But what we got a chance to do. Uh, and we spent several hours doing this uh, at B-Sides Orlando because their, 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 their hangout area was actually outdoors. It's Florida. Mm, it was beautiful. Sure. You know, she sat down and said, look, I don't know traditional networking. I grew up on mm -hmm. containers and Kubernetes. I don't know all that old stuff. And I'm like, okay, I know all the old stuff. I also know PCI. So we actually walked through PCI requirement by requirement. And I said, well, this is what PCI requires. This is this is what it means in sort of the traditional classical context of networking, and and then we and she's like, oh, uh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, you can do that. It's done do differently. this way, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. but yeah. this is how you do it with containers. Mm -hmm. and, you, you do it with this black magic. That should yep. be a book, um, <laughs> right? There, it, but, it, it, but it's hard to translate. There needs to be like more I said. Of that. Oh, I I agree. It's but hard I, to I, I like this stuff stuff O'Shea's uh, suggestion yeah. that it needs to be like. A book to help translate the traditional the way old of thinking to the new with with the new and Jeff those yeah. conversations you're having with people like Ian are Alho. are so <laughs> valuable right like yeah, 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 you, yeah you three should write a book like I, I, well, I dealt with the QSA totally. recently and we I won't go into like our tech stack but a lot of it is in cloud and some of the questions he was asking was based upon his his other understanding of system administration and network administration. It was like, no, no, this is how you do it in AWS. And it was like, oh, and really most of his answers were, show me how you audit it. And I was like, here we go, right here. This is this right. is it, right and here. I'll, I'll like, give you another great example well, of that. I know so, who your QSA is. So. <laughs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, but I'll give you a great example of that. I work for Toys R Us. Um, it's a public record. <laughs> I was explaining earlier to someone, you know, some of my, my background in security, and a lot of that revolves around DNS, looking yeah. at DNS exploits and vulnerabilities, but also doing a lot of DNS projects because... Uh, TCP IP Illustrated Volume 1, Richard Stevens, was a great read for me. I read the DNS chapter twice. To be, It's not here. I uh, sh it should be. I I was, think it used to be here. I have two copies. I think I gave one copy to someone. Because it, it used to be like right over there on the bookshelf. Yeah, but so I read that DNS chapter twice to be able to basically pass my test and then did DNS projects, right? And I gained all this knowledge. When you look at Route 53, which is Amazon's yeah. DNS, mm -hmm. DNS service, and we were watching some videos about you know, how it worked and trying to learn it. And I'm like, I, I have no idea what they're talking about. Like, I have, I have to go study this more. And this is an area of networking, obviously fundamental to the internet, mm -hmm. fundamental that to a lot, of, a lot of that time. I spent a lot of time yep. on it. I'm like, I, I need to go back through that, all of that material, right? And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it's something that we as an industry need to embrace and understand that there are new technologies that are, different in their implementations of our older technologies yeah. that are not bad. It just requires a different level of understanding. And yeah. we've and abstracted away some of that understanding away in right. the way that these systems <laughs> are true. configured. I want right? to go edit you my bind zone to. file. Like, where is my... Oh, no, it's not a zone <laughs> file. It's a, it's a YAML file that's right. somewhere, right? But you right? don't yeah. have to... If, if In this new world, you don't have to understand the underlying aspects of... How the technology no, works—it's been abstracted yes. all away to the point where 
we, we don't even understand the underlying principles of some of these configurations anymore. Because we, yeah, well, we never had to learn them from the basics. The old guys I, did. I think that's I think that's the I think that's dangerous though, and I think you think that's Jeff. you, Matt. Um, uh, this is why you listen to the gray beards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wrap, wrapping up the 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 you know the the uh, what I was saying about my conversation with Ian, we have talked about doing a uh, you know sort of a joint presentation sometime to do sort of this compare and contrast. Uh, two points. One is. PCI, in terms of principle or spirit of the law, you know, completely holds up. What PCI suggests in sort of a traditional manner of how you accomplish the underlying security goal or requirement, you know, maybe that changed. And, and what's needed is people that can translate it into whatever the technology is that you're using. Uh, we discussed this. To, I don't think I've done this before, but uh, if you ha if you don't know. We have this new show called Security and Compliance Weekly. Last week, we inter or this past week, uh, we interviewed Chris Roberts, and we talked a lot about the idea of the you know the spirit of the law in terms of compliance. So, uh, encourage you guys to listen to that. It sort of touches on a lot of what we're talking about here. I'll shut up now and pass it back to Paul. Yeah, Lee, uh, closing thoughts. Uh, I think. You touched on what I was trying to get to is we have the old guard has to train the new guard or vice versa. We yeah, got to train each other. Yep. And we can't step on the enthusiasm. I agree. Because we're they're really excited about this new world in there. And that is awesome. And to be honest with you, I've looked at controls and how to meet them for way too long. I love the new ways to solve this mm -hmm. the old problem. That is so cool. And when you get these guys that are all excited, when they realize what the hell you want... And they're like, oh, we can freaking do that. Yeah. This is how you do it. And I'm going, show me. This is cool. It it makes for a whole different engagement than the old traditional go through the the audit and all that. So I I, I think that's a really key point. And 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 Jeff made some outstanding points, and you did too, about how that can really work to get us going in this brave new world. Yeah, and I think okay. you know my enthusiasm last week with my technical segment was kind of that merging of old and new was I could take these services that I'm deploying and use the newer methods, but also blend that with some traditional network and security methods that ultimately can culminate in a much better way, in a more secure way to deploy these services. Right? In a more proactive way. Yes. That we haven't done before, right? I mean, typically we've always been outside of the development process we've always been at the end and we've always tried to figure out how to bolt on security devops gives us the opportunity to integrate security yeah, into the true. pipeline that if we can figure out this translation discussion we can f let the developers find new and innovative ways to accomplish what we want to do that we've always had to do from the outside right versus being integrated into the pipeline and you have an influential step because you can since you break the build if you feel like it's very insecure like this this doesn't pass the match like this doesn't pass what we have as well it's interesting i think that's an old traditional adage right of, but, but it's like it's, the school of no like the, i think there are to your point or but shit, like, i don't have to say no now it's like yeah break it like yeah. that bill, that bill that's doesn't essentially pass. no <laughs> but it's for a much shorter period of time right it's like Until this is so it, yeah. critical and i've made my point that this is going to break the build and if we can get developers to that point in agreement that no like this should really break your build right they'll be comfortable with that because developers at the end of the day good developers don't want to push out code that is insecure because no. it lacks integrity right and if you're a developer you don't want to push out crappy code you want to push out code that's easily broken yeah. so when we come and say when you meet this condition, like unfortunately we're gonna have to break the build and we're gonna have that feedback loop so you can fix that problem and then push it forward, right? And I think yeah. that's a really interesting conversation we can have with developers today that we couldn't have five or 10 years ago. Well, the right? controls weren't baked into one one pot essentially. So that now it is, so it's yes. it's a great time to be alive in security. It, there is something I did wanna say though, that when I get asked a lot about what did I do to get to where I am, like I'm, I'm 36, whatever, but when I get asked by younger people, I'm like, I listen to the older people. <laughs> like, I'm being like dead serious. I was like, I listen to the gray beards. 
<laughs> the great birds well, have all the knowledge. Like if you just listen to them and don't think you know everything, you'd be surprised. Yeah, a lot of that but knowledge, the problem, but that translates, right? It, yeah, it it's the translate. translation yes. of the old beards, right? Of us curmudgeons that grew up in a networking world, uh, a very data centric world, physical a very, servers, uh, physical a physical very Unix perimeter based world, the best. <laughs> right? We have to be able to translate that into what they know today from a technology perspective, and we don't sometimes do a good job of that but if we can break that barrier mm -hmm. then i think we can get to the point where they can learn from us but if, if we just keep in our old static ways of how we did security 20 years ago we won't get there yeah no, I, I totally but a lot agree. of that comes down to the experience right like you got to leverage the experience like this is why it is the way it is, and this is why we did it back in the day. This is the experience that we have of how this got broken across the period of time and the lessons we learned from these particular things. You can actually see those security vulnerabilities and the configuration mistakes that are being made in the new technologies. And a simple fix that, like you said, is translated or applied to new tech is then you're building on the shoulders of giants. You've got decades of experience. Well, modifying it and translating that to the newer version, that's when it gets. Uh, that's when you start to really see good things built mm. but you've got one more piece and that is that those of us that are extending the hand across the aisle to the to the younger generation the gray birds we've got to evangelize them up to the other gray beards who still think they're on smoke and mirrors over here we've got to support them to continue to do the right thing otherwise they'll walk away if they or, or or worse. Which, well, and to that which, point, Lee, I, I've gone back to people in my career that have, to O'Shea's point, instilled knowledge on me. I turned to the more experienced people. And one of those more experienced people was uh, a founder and CEO of a company that I worked for. And his tagline that I take away from that was embrace change, right? Yeah. Who, and, moved, who moved my cheese? Yes, exactly. It's, yeah. a, it's a several pages out of uh, the Who Moved My Cheese book, right? Yep. Embrace embrace change and embrace i think that's yeah. well a lot of what our uh, you know older folks like myself that have racked and stacked servers and had physical network cables and ports to plug into uh need to kind of take on as a mission to embrace change right it doesn't mean that you're not applying the same things you know it's just it's different now and it's changed and you need yeah, to right. embrace Embrace Are you saying chain. chain or change? Because change. Like change. change. Embrace, embrace change. Embrace blockchain is what I'm hearing. Embrace change. I mean, he used to say it with such enthusiasm and raise his arms. Embrace change, right? And there's lots of points in the organizations that we are leaders in today that that is applicable to not just changes in the organization but changes in technology and the way we do things so with this just with it which is just a variation on everything's broken and we don't know what we're doing let's keep moving forward right. <laughs> there is that that's <laughs> yeah. great go to the next feature yes <laughs> and with that that will conclude the show thank you everyone for listening and watching and participating in this show larry take us out over and out <laughs>